Revelation chapter 10. Why don't we read through it? It says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head. And his face was as it were of the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea, his left foot on the earth. And he cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he had declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open, and the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, and it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Interesting chapter. It's one of those chapters, if you're doing, you know, Russian roulette Bible study, which nobody here does, which means you flip it open, and whatever it is, that's what God must be speaking to you today. I recommend don't study a Bible like that. Read it. Read the same chapter over and over again. But sometimes we do that, which is, which is cool. But if you get to this chapter, you think you're hearing things like a strong angel, one foot upon the sea, one foot upon the earth, a little book in his hand, his feet burning like fire, roaring like a lion. What is going on here? Well, remember, as we've been traveling through the book of Revelation, okay, listen, if you, if you haven't heard the studies, we have an app to make it easy for you. Get the app, and you can listen right on your phone, wherever, you know, whatever it is that you're doing. But as we've been going through the book of Revelation, we see we're in the end times, future times portion of the book of Revelation. Remember, the divine outline of Revelation is in Revelation 119. Write the things which you have seen, John. This is to John, Jesus telling John this. Write the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Now, in Revelation chapter 4, we see, Come up here, John, into heaven, and I will show you things that will be hereafter. So we're in the hereafter portion. Now, what has taken place up till this point? Now, remember, John's in exile on the island of Patmos, a little rock in the midst of the Mediterranean. He was exiled there because of his testimony in love for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was sent there just to live out the rest of his days and then die off. What he did there was this. He wrote the book of Revelation. Jesus appeared to him, and Jesus used an angel to tell him to write some things down. And what he wrote was the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation was a book that went out to seven churches in Asia. Seven pastors were supposed to send seven messengers to go to Patmos get the book of Revelation from John, bring it back to their churches, and read it in the churches, okay? Now we know in the book of Revelation, it wasn't only for the first century for those seven churches, it's for us. It's for us to discern the signs of the times and what's going on. I believe that the latter portion of the book of Revelation is ready to burst forth on this earth. All the signs are in place. All the signs are there. But what we've come to so... To so far is this. If you remember Revelation chapter 5, you see somebody sitting on a throne. You see a scroll in the hand of someone sitting on the throne. The person sitting on the throne is probably God the Father. And then remember, John is caught up into heaven and he's looking around heaven and somebody, a, a loud angel proclaims who is worthy to take that scroll 
and unloose the seals of that scroll in, the, in God the Father's hand. And John looks around, and he starts to weep because no one was worthy in heaven, on earth, or under the earth to come and take the scroll out of his hand who sits on the throne. The scroll is the title deed to the earth. And who is worthy to take ownership of the earth? Any man, it says, no one in heaven, on earth, or under the earth was worthy to do that. Okay? He weeps bitterly. Then finally, an angel taps him on the shoulder and says, Hey, John, don't weep. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed so as to take the scroll and unloose the seals thereof. So someone has prevailed. Who is it? Jesus, the Lamb of God. And where does he come from? He rises up from the throne because he's God. But he's the God-man. He says, I look and I saw it was someone like a lamb because Jesus had been slain. That's what made him worthy to take back the earth, that he died for the earth's sins, for man's sins. Now, this is where we go. He starts to unloose the seals of that scroll. Okay, it was sealed seven times. Seven's the number of completion. Nobody could open it except for the rightful owner. As he unlooses each seal, a judgment is poured out on the earth. You say, why is a judgment being poured out on the earth in this time? Well, because Jod, Jod, God, it's blasphemous almost, God has to judge the earth for its unrighteousness because God is righteous before he takes back the earth. He has to pour out his fury and his vengeance on a Christ-rejecting world. He stayed his hand of judgment for so long. Now, finally, we're in the day and age where God says, you know what? Enough iniquity. I have to judge. And after he judges, he takes back the earth and he reigns forever and ever. So he, as he opens up the, the, the scroll and unlooses the seals, every time he opens it, there's a scene in heaven that John is seeing, okay? A judgment hit the, hits the earth. When he gets to the seventh seal, Okay? Remember, out of the seventh seal come seven trumpet judgments. All right? Then he starts to see these angels blow these trumpets in heaven. Now, that's the scene in heaven. When he sees a scene in heaven, remember, something goes on on the earth. An angel blows the trumpet and a judgment hits the earth. Remember, when he gets to the seventh trumpet, the last of God's judgments hit the earth. They're the seven bowl judgments. So where are we in the midst of all that God judging the earth at this time. Well, a quarter of the earth's population has already perished through, the, through deception, famine, pestilence, war. Okay? Probably nuclear warfare is alluded to in the book of Revelation and in the book of Joel, by the way. It's very interesting. We're in the midst of that now. Six trumpets have been blown. Before he describes what happens in the seventh trumpet, because remember, the seventh trumpet, when that is blown in heaven, the last bold judgments come out of the seventh trumpet judgment. We're in a, in a period here in Revelation 10 that there's, there's kind of a, a pause. There's kind of a pause that goes on. Just like between the sixth and the seventh seal, there was a pause so we can see what was happening with God's people, the saints that were being martyred. Now there's a pause for us to see that God is in control of all things, that God knows exactly what's going on, that God has the power and the authority to take back the earth. And we see that pause here. And what we're going to try to do in Revelation chapter 10 is to, is to discern who this angel is, what the delay is that's going on, or why has God been delaying judging the world, and then what's the little book all about? Verse 1, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. Now he says another mighty angel, okay? He's already seen mighty angels blow trumpets. He's already seen mighty angels dispatch from God's throne to judge the earth, okay? He sees another mighty angel. The word another is the word alos in the Greek, which means another of the same kind. I saw another angel, another powerful angel that I, like I already saw before, and he's dispatched from heaven. He's to come down. Some people try to make this angel, because remember, angel means messenger. They try to make this angel Jesus Christ. Because the way he's described, his face shines like the sun, his feet are like pillars of fire, like Jesus' feet are in Revelation chapter 1. I don't think that it is Jesus Christ. Because it says another of the same kind. There's nobody like Jesus Christ. The Bible's clear on that. Okay? So this angel's dispatched from heaven, and he's to come down. He comes down from heaven, and now we get his appearance. 
He's clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Remember, watch for those words in the book of Revelation. Watch for the word like and as. He doesn't say the angel's feet were fire, all right? He doesn't say that. It was as that. It was like that. He's trying to describe something for us. So remember, when John gets the vision of Revelation, he's seeing things in a heavenly realm. When things happen in a heavenly realm, they affect the earth, okay? He's trying to describe to us a heavenly scene. You'll see that as you go through the book of Revelation. I looked and I saw, or I looked and I saw, and it was like this and it was like that. He's trying to describe to us something in the heavenlies, and he's trying to make it so we can understand it with the way we understand things and the way we see things, all right? So this angel comes down. Now, it's interesting. In chapter 9, you see a lot of things come up from the pit of hell. The demons are just let loose on the earth. God says to the earth, all right, you guys want to live like hell and you want to reject my son, Jesus Christ? I'm going to let all the demons out. And they're going to torture men. This is what you want. God lets them out. Revelation 10 is the answer for that. Now an angel from God comes down to the earth and he sees this angel. Now listen, literally, if you can peel back this space-time continuum and look into the heavenlies and kind of see what goes on when it comes to spiritual warfare, you would see some of this stuff. We don't fully get that. The Bible's clear. It says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, against one another, but against principalities and powers, spiritual rulers in high places, meaning that there's powers out there behind the scenes at work in another dimension that are really controlling things. And, and, the, and the Bible says the way we defeat that and fight against that is to put on the armor of God, use the word of God, always praying in the spirit. That's why our battle isn't often with one another or with our, or with our spouses, with our bosses. It's often in the spiritual realm. We need God's perspective on things, okay? Now, he sees this angel. What does he look like? He's clothed with a cloud, a rainbow, was upon his head. A cloud. Why a cloud? Cloud, if you read in the Old Testament over and over again, the Bible says God is coming in the clouds of judgment. He's coming to bring judgment on the earth. He's coming to bring judgment to the earth. Now watch. It says a rainbow was upon his head. His face was as it were the sun. His face wasn't the sun. It looked like the sun. It was shining like the sun. Why? Because we know that the glory of God, God radiates, that God is pure. This is a holy angel. The angels are always in the midst of the presence of God. So they're refracting God's glory, all right? It says he's, his face was like the sun, his feet as pillars of fire. Fire, always in the Bible, is a symbol of judgment, all right? So he's coming down to the earth, and he's coming to bring judgment. Now listen. And he had in his hand a little book open. And he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Listen. The earth and the sea compared to this angel are puny. Okay? Little. Say, Pastor Matt, I thought this was in the spiritual realm. Well, yes, it is. The earth and the sea are literal, all right? Physical. The angels in the spirit realm. But obviously, John's able to see through this the might and the power of this angel. And the only way he can describe him is he's so big, he's so mighty, and he's so powerful that he's, he's able to put one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, all right? And he, as he sees this angel, he's looking at it, and as he keeps looking at this angel, he sees that he's got a little book in his hand. He's got a book there. It's a little book. Now, what was the book? As I read and I study through Revelation, many people think the book he has in his hand is the same scroll that Jesus opened the seven seals, and then he passes it off to the angels, and then the seven trumpet judgments come out of that because it's the same Greek word that's used. Why would that book be in his hand? Why? Because remember, after the seventh trumpet is sounded, there's only seven more bowl judgments that are going to hit the earth, and then God is done judging the earth, and he takes back the earth. 
That could be the little book that's in his hand. We're not 100% sure, but get the vision, get the picture. He sees this massive mighty angel, cloud, rainbow. This is what he saw. Then he sees his feet burning like fire, and then all of a sudden he looks and he sees a little book in his hand. Now, why is it little? You say, Pastor Matt, if, if, if that is the same book or the same scroll that was in God the Father's hand, that Jesus took out of his right hand and opened up the seals? Why is that a little book? Isn't it so significant? Well, I'm going to tell you why it's little, why I think. I didn't study this from any commentary. I'm not a scholar or the son of a scholar, but this is what I think. I think because the judgments that come out of it and the horror that has gone on in this earth since the beginning of time are just a little blip on the radar screen compared to all of eternity that we're going to have with God. That's why it's just a little book. That's why it's just a little. See, we focus on so much on the here and the now, and why is this happening, and why is that, and you're going to see that in a minute. He's going to explain some of that to us. But compared to eternity, what God has in store for us, that we'll be with God forever and ever, the infinite mind of God, Spurgeon said, is going to come up with an infinite number of tasks for his people to do for eternity. What has gone on on this earth, the horror that has gone on, it's just a little blip on the radar screen compared to what's going to happen in eternity. And he sees this little book in this angel's hand. Now look what happens. What did the angel do? Verse 3. It says, he cried with a loud voice as, remember, he wasn't a lion. It sounded like a lion to him, though. As when a lion roars... And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. So he sees this angel, one foot on the sea, one foot on the land. And then he hears something come out of this angel's mouth, crying. And he goes, the only thing I can describe it like to me was when a lion roars in the jungle. Everybody perks up. Everybody pays attention. Everybody knows there's something powerful going on here. And the angel cries, and what comes out of his mouth is seven thunders. And voices come out of the thunders. Now, what are those? We're not told. Verse 4. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Now, it's interesting. Because the book of Revelation is the book that things are supposed to be unveiled, uncovered, not sealed up. If you go back to Daniel and his writings and his prophecy, Daniel is told to seal up his vision and his prophecy until the times of the end. All right? And then Daniel says, knowledge will increase. People will run to and fro upon the earth. Things will be happening, fast communication, fast travel. See, those things aren't sealed up anymore. Those things are happening right now. So we know we're in the last days. But for some reason, John is told here, to seal up what the seven thunders and the voices that you heard come out of that. Why seal it up? Now, there's been books written and commentaries written trying to explain what it means or what it is. I don't know, but I'll take a shot. I think he's told to seal it up because the last of God's judgments are going to fall. And they're horrendous when they hit the earth. Could I be wrong? I'm not sure. But when you get to the end of this chapter... He talks about it, he's supposed to eat the book, and it's bitter and it's sweet. And I think he's seeing the last of God's judgments that are going to hit the earth before God takes back the earth. Now watch. Verse 5. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven. So picture this. He sees this massive angel, one foot on the earth, one foot on the sea, and I think God's trying to tell us something as he describes this over and over again. The earth and the sea, the earth and the sea, the earth and the sea, this angel dispatched from heaven. Know what he's trying to say? God's trying to say, I'm the one that owns the earth. I'm the one that's in charge here. And he uses this angel to cry out and tell people that. I'm the one that's in charge. I'm the one that's in control. I'm the one that has authority over the earth. Now watch. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that lives forever and ever. He's swearing by God who created heaven, the things that are therein are, the earth, the things that therein are, the sea, the things which are therein, 
that there should be time no longer. This is what he swears. There's going to be time no longer. Now, what's he talking about? The Greek word's chronos, okay? Like a time clock. But in the context here, we know that it can't be there's no more time at this point because if you read through Revelation, it talks about, talks about 42 weeks and everything. I mean, 42 months and all this stuff that's going to go on. It can't be talking about no more time from that point on. That's the eternal state. Can't be talking about that because there's more judgments that come forth in the book of Revelation. All right? Can't be talking about time. So what is he talking about? Most scholars think what he's describing here is God's time for delaying his judgment and his doing something about sin is no longer. He's not going to delay anymore. He's not going to delay anymore. When people say, why this and why that? And people say, you know, why did God create the earth anyway if you knew this was going to happen? And people say, you know what? Why did God create a man that had the ability to sin? Or why did God create Lucifer, an angel, who had the ability to fall? Or why does God let this happen and that happen? And people starve and famine and pestilence and everything. Why does God do this? Why is God doing this? Why is there a hell? Why is all this stuff going on? Why did my spouse die? Why did my child die? Why? Why, can't you do something about this, God? People have been asking these questions forever. If God is all-powerful, and if God is all-knowing, and if God is all-loving, can't he stop something from happening? Of course he can. The Bible tells us in the next verse it's a mystery. But the mystery is going to stop, and there's going to be a time where there's no more God delaying him judging and him doing something about what's going on. That's going to happen. No more. Look at the next verse. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. What mystery? The mystery of how can a holy God allow evil? How? How can a holy God not judge it right away? That mystery. Read through in the book of Revelation. It's called the mystery of iniquity. Now think about this. You have to go back to a first cause, right? You have to. The Bible said is God, that the, the Bible tells us that God is all good. He's all loving. He's all knowing. He's all powerful. So how can a all loving, all powerful, all-knowing God allow these horrible things to happen? How can an all-loving, all-powerful, all-knowing God make it personal, let things go on in my life that really pain me and hurt me and hurt you and pain you with my spouse, with my loved one, with my children? How can that happen? And we know it's a result of sin, but how can this happen? It says, finally, when the seven trumpet is sounded, there's no more that God's finally going to do something about it. Finally. Now, we know from the eternal perspective, when Jesus came to the earth and he paid for the penalty for our sins on the cross, he did something about it to give us eternal life. But what about the judgment of the wicked? Listen, I want to tell you something. and It might freak you out a little bit here. See, it's already freaking me out. Listen, when you're there at the end with God, right? The Bible says, when John says, I looked and I saw one sit on the throne upon wh whose face the earth and the heaven fled away from it. And he says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God and the books were open. And they're all judged. Those who don't love Jesus are judged. And the Bible's clear. It's eternity in the lake of fire. That's what it says. There's no way around it. But when you see that happen, because you're going to be there, okay? You're not the dead. You're the living because you believe in Jesus. He who believes in me will never die, okay? You're not the dead. You're the living. You're alive in Jesus Christ. If you know God, you're alive in Christ. You're going to be there when he judges the unsaved dead. And in their cast into the lake of fire. But you know what you're not going to be doing? You're not going to be going, oh, I feel bad for this one. Oh, that's horrible that that's happening to that one. You're not going to have pity. Let me give you an Old Testament example. 
when the priest, okay, those who were called to be priests in the Old Testament, when their family members died, the priests weren't allowed to mourn their family members. You know why? You know why? Because the priest represented God, okay, as a go-between between man and God. And God told those priests, it's not my fault that people sin. I allow it, but it's their fault. And don't make me look bad. That's what God said. The priests weren't allowed to mourn in public the death of their loved one. You say, that's terrible. That's horrible. No, it's not. Because God said, I don't want anybody thinking and blaming me for, for, for death. That's why. That's why in the end, when God judges the unsaved dead, even if it's a family member that's there or a loved one, you're not going to be standing there saying, oh, this isn't right. Oh, how can this happen? Blah, 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 blah. You know what you're going to be doing? You're going to be shouting to God saying, righteous are you, God. Holy and true and righteous and pure are you, God. That's what you're going to be saying. And then you're going to say, because you redeem me. You gave me eternal life. Because I should be over there. But I'm only over here because of you. And you give him glory during that time. Now, it doesn't mean God's going to be, you no know, dancing around in heaven doing backflips when he judges people. That's not what that means. But you're not going to be pitying people. He says, finally, the mystery of God, verse 7, should be finished. As he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. What's he talking about? What's John talking about? Read through the Old Testament. The prophets talk about the times of refreshing, the times when all the wrongs are made right, the times when God reverses the curse, the times when, you know, the wolf and the child go together and, uh, you know, and the lamb and a little child leads them, all those things. Those times are coming on the earth, and I'm telling you, it's close. It's about to burst forth on the earth. It's so close. Listen, as you read through the book of Revelation, you see the beast, the false prophets, false religion. You see all these things. And it says the whole world wonders after the beast. They're wondering, wow, what is going on? Can we do something about this? Could the beast be right among us in the religion of Islam? Maybe. Maybe. Read 1 John chapter 2. It talks about who is Antichrist. This is Antichrist. He who denies the Son denies the Father. This is the spirit of Antichrist, right? In one of the most holiest places in all of Israel, where the Dome of the Rock sits, it's the third holiest place to the religion of Islam. You know what they put on the, the perimeter of their mosque? It says, God is not begotten, nor does he beget. You know what that means? That God has no Son. The Bible says that's the spirit of Antichrist. That is Antichrist. Very interesting. We're in the last days. Let's finish the chapter. So what happens? And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, verse 8, and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. Now, all right, John's getting this vision in the heavenlies. He's just a puny man, all right? This angel's massive in the spirit realm. Foot on the land, foot on the sea. Now God probably, it's probably God speaking to him saying, hey, I want you to go to that angel and ask him for that book. I'm saying, you want me to do that? Can you do that? But he goes and he asks him for the book. And I went unto the angel. Now how did he go? How did he go? Did he surf on the sea? What did he do? How did he go? I know, somehow in the spirit, things kind of get done. Maybe he went in his thought and he was able to go there. Think about that in heaven, right? You know, think about, what are we going to do in heaven? We're going to walk the streets of gold. And that's all physical language trying to describe to us what it's going to be like in heaven. What if you can just think it and be there? You know, God wants you to visit so-and-so today. And you think it and you're there. Interesting. So how did he go? Maybe he thought it. God told him to do it. He thought it. And he's there next to the angel. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Go ahead and take it. Now eat it up. And it shall make your belly bitter. And it shall be in your mouth sweet as honey. He says, Take it and devour it. 
take it and eat it. It's interesting because if you read Ezekiel, Ezekiel was told to do the same thing. He goes, take that scroll, that, that, that scroll, take that book and eat it up. And in it was written lamentations and woes and judgments of God that was coming upon Israel. And it said Ezekiel took it and it was sweet, but then it became bitter because the children of Israel rejected the message of God. John's experiencing the same thing, but it's not just for Israel. It's for the whole Christ rejecting world. He says he took the book. He was told to eat it. Now, did he literally sit there with a fork and knife and say, hey, let me cut off this corner, all right? It's good. Pages there. It's good, you know, a little black and white on those things. What he's saying is take it in. Devour it. That's what we're supposed to do with the Word of God. That's why when you read the Word of God, right, when you read God's Word, you don't just read it and say, hey, I learned something new today. You're supposed to meditate on it. You're supposed to think on it. You're supposed to come to it like a mirror, James tells us. You know what that means? When you look in the mirror in the morning and your hair's going this way and it's going that way, you say, Pastor Matt, did you look in the mirror this morning? I don't know. I don't know. But when you look in the mirror, if there's something going on, you got to fix it, right? By the way, if I ever have a boogie, tell me. All right? I'm not one of those here. You ever get that, this weird feeling? You know, I don't want to tell them. I don't know, should I tell this person? What do I do? I don't know. And you look, and you're trying not to look at the boogie, but you're like, you know, you're doing this, and what do you do, right? If I ever have one, just tell me, all right? And I'll do one of these, and I'll just put it over here for later. All right. But listen, see, you'll remember something about the message now. It's good. But listen, when you read the Word of God, you're supposed to read it like a mirror. You're supposed to devour it. When you look into a mirror, you're fixed. You're supposed to fix what's wrong. That's why you have a mirror, to make yourself look good and prettied up and whatever it is. That's how you're supposed to read the Word of God. You're supposed to meditate on it. You're supposed to look at it and say, oh, man, that's really speaking to me. My, my, my life doesn't line up in this area. God, forgive me. i got to get it right. Thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in this area. You're actually doing this in my life. Thank you, Jesus. That's how you're supposed to read the Word of God, and you're supposed to fix what's broken. Say, I can't fix it. Well, yeah, you can with the power of Jesus Christ. John's told to take this book and devour it. Take it in. Meditate on it. Read it. And he goes, it was bitter sweet. Verse 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. Why? Why? Why was it bitter sweet? It was bittersweet because it was bitter because more judgment's going to hit the earth and people are going to be judged and condemned eternally. But it was sweet because finally God is going to reign on the earth. Finally, there's going to be a time when there's no more death, sorrow, tears, the former things are passed away. That's why it's sweet. That's why it's sweet. It's kind of like when a believer leaves the earth. It's bittersweet. It's sweet because we know they're in a better place, but it's bitter because you can't see them no more. Those of us who, who have lost a son or a daughter or a spouse or a mother or father that are believer in Jesus, it's bittersweet. It's bitter because it's painful. But it's sweet because we know they're with Jesus. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. Many scholars think this has a reference to you got to complete the writing of the book of Revelations, cause, Revelation, because it's going to go out in the, to the whole world and we're going to preach the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. Listen, this is the church's job. The church's job is to continue on because it's, it's our job to prophesy who, but before what? Many people, nations, tongues, and kings. We're to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, not just from a pulpit. I tell people all the time, this is the easy part. It is. Because people that come to church, they're expecting for you to open the Bible and tell them that. But the hard part is when you're over there and on the job site and at work and with family members and you, and you preach the gospel and you tell them, yeah, you're a nut, you're crazy. In some parts of the world, it means you're head. But that's the job of the church until Jesus comes to speak and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ.